Luke 22, we'll begin our reading in verse 31. The Bible says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and, and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day, before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. Let's pray. Our Father, we sure do thank you for the good singing, the testimonies. We thank you for being a good God that neither slumbers nor sleeps, that is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Lord, if we's honest tonight, there's been many times we dreaded something only to find our dread and our fears uh, flee away at thy presence. And God, you've been able to help us and hold us and get us through things that we never thought we could ever get through. But your grace is truly sufficient. Now, Lord, I pray for those that are working with the children on the other side. You'd bless their efforts. I pray for those children. The Word of God would find itself lodged deep in their hearts and begin to take root. Lord, when they reach the age of accountability, they trust in Christ as Lord and Savior. Those that have reached the age that aren't saved, I pray that you would uh, convict their tender hearts and we'd see them saved. Uh, Lord, uh, those that are saved, I pray that they'd grow in the Lord. I pray for those that are working with the teens the same. And I do pray that you'd help us tonight, that you would uh, uh, cause uh, the Word of God not to fall on deaf ears, but may it be embraced, may we truly uh, 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 glean from it, and may we grow thereby that you would be glorified in our lives. Uh, use this unworthy vessel, uh, help these I people. If anybody in here tonight is unsaved, I pray tonight would be the night of their salvation. Uh, Lord Jesus, we love you. You are great and greatly to be praised, and we praise your blessed holy name. Uh, have your will and way now, for it is in that holy name, the name above every name, the name of the Lord Jesus, we do pray. Amen and amen. We find several things here uh, uh, in Luke 22. Uh, we find that uh, Peter, who has uh, to this point in his life uh, too many times gotten too big for his britches, uh, uh, he thought that he was invincible, he thought that uh, he knew more than uh, 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 the Lord himself on several occasions. We even find the Lord calls him Satan one, day, uh, one time uh, uh, because he was trying to rebuke the Lord and correct the Lord. Uh, we find when they come to arrest the Lord, Peter's uh, quick to uh, pull out his sword, chop off an ear uh, uh, of one of the uh, soldiers there. Uh, 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 and of course the Lord again had to straighten him out. He said, if you're going to live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. Uh, and it seems like Peter is constantly uh, in the presence of the Lord, but he's constantly uh, uh, getting on the Lord's nerves. The Lord's having to straighten him out. The Lord's having to work on him. Aren't you glad that many times we get on the Lord's nerves? Uh, he still works on us. Uh, but I want you to notice some things from these verses. Notice, if you will, the illuminating. The illuminating. Look in verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold. In other words, uh, uh, take watch. Look around. You're about ready to find out something. He says, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. Notice the Lord uh, reveals to Peter exactly uh, what was about to happen in Peter's life. Can I say one of the wonderful things about the Word of God is when we uh, 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 open it up, begin to read it, begin to hear it teach, begin to hear it preach, uh, uh, the Lord through the Holy Spirit of God will illuminate uh, our minds and our hearts to what God is saying. And many times God is warning us, uh, He's showing us some things that will transpire and we better take note. Uh, it is a dangerous thing to come to the house of God and let the word of God go in one ear and out the other. And God is always trying to show us something. I don't care if you've heard John 3.16 preached on 3,000 times. If you come looking for God, you'll see something you never saw before. We see the Lord is trying to show Peter something. He's trying to get Peter's attention. He's trying to reveal to Peter some great truth that Peter's about ready to go through. Can I say this? Most of the time, before we go through a trial, the Lord's already tried to warn us. He's already tried to prepare us and equip us for something we may face. We may never have any idea of the significance of it or how great it may be, 
but the Lord is always trying to prepare us uh, for things to come. Now, you've heard me say many times, you might not need this message tonight, but you better store it up because there's coming a day you're going to need it. So we see the illuminating. Notice the interceding. Look in verse 32. The Lord says, But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. The Lord uh, reveals to Peter that Satan has desired him to sift him as wheat. You know what a sifter is. A sifter lets the pure things get through uh, and the impurities to be held out. And can I say, I imagine it's not a good thing to go through a sifter, something to uh, uh, take parts of you out that you are very comfortable with in your life. Uh, uh, but then we find that the Lord gives that great encouraging statement. He says, Peter, I'm going to get you out of this. No. He says, but I have prayed for thee, that thy faith faileth not. Can I say, the Lord is our intercessor. He does pray for us. And can I say, a lot of times, Brother Clint, it isn't the Lord's will to get us out of something. It's the Lord's will to strengthen us through something. So we find the interceding. We find the illuminating. Notice, if you will, the instructing. Look at verse 32 again. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Now what's he talking about converted? I thought Peter already knew the Lord. He did. He's talking about when he's converted from his failure, from this trial, from this sifting, because the Lord knows Peter's going to hit rock bottom. And the Lord knows that he's going to convince Peter to forgive himself, and Peter's going to go on and do great things for the Lord. But he says, Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. Hmm? Can I say this, no doubt, was a trial that Peter was going to go through that would knock uh, the props out from under Peter. But it was also a trial that Peter would use to help brethren um, generations to come. And we find it in the epistles that he wrote. Notice Peter, like many Baptists, ignoring Look at verse 33. And he said unto him, Lord, I'm ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. Hmm? Isn't it amazing how much we tell God that we, we know? Oh, Lord, I'm ready. I'm ready for what you have for me. Lord, I, I, I'm able to do this. Lord, let me do this. And let me do that. Hmm? Uh, can I help you with something? The Lord knows everything about your frame. He knows what you can handle and what you can't handle. But here's Peter bragging, I'm ready to go with you to death. Hmm? I'm ready to die for you, God. You, you know how many times I've heard people say, I'm ready to die for the Lord. Well, you don't want you to die for him. I want you to live for him. That's right. Amen. Hmm? Amen. Peter was so misguided. I'm ready to go with you to prison. No, you wasn't. And he proves it in his life for the next morning light comes into fruition. Can I say we see what's impending? Verse 34. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. And we know in reading the rest of the chapter, Peter does deny him three times. Hmm? We find Peter warming by the devil's fire, cussing the Lord. Hmm? Doesn't sound like somebody was ready to die for him, does it? Hmm? Can I say, you don't know what you yourself are capable of doing in any moment. And in a weak moment, you really don't know what you're capable of doing. So you better not lean under your understanding. You better abide in Christ and say, if the Lord willing, I'll do this and I'll do that. Hmm? But I want you to notice, if you will, again, verse number 31. And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. And I said early on that somebody needs this tonight, and what I'm going to preach on tonight are the devil's desires. It says, Satan hath desired to have you. And make no mistake, we have a real enemy. The Bible says, Be sober, be vigilant to your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You have a real enemy tonight. You are in a battle. You are facing a, a foe that is much greater than you, much stronger than you, uh, 
And this foe that we do face that is an enemy does have desires. Uh, and sometime he has a desire to have you. Hmm? I preached some time ago on being in the devil's bullseye. Sometimes uh, 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 you're in the cross uh, uh, hairs, and sometimes the Lord's looking, uh, uh, looking to defend you out of uh, the bullseye of the devil. Sometimes he's got you. Brother Clint's got the picture tonight, a couple of uh, uh, turkeys he got this spring. Boy, beautiful animals, going to be good eating at the how household uh, come Thanksgiving. Uh, but I want to tell you something. Sometimes the devil wants to take you out. And the devil does have desires. Sometimes it might be Brother Kevin. Other times it might be Brother Phil. But make no, no mistakes. He has desires and he wants to destroy each and every one of us. The Bible says we're not ignorant of his devices. Can I say the same way that he deceived Eve? He's deceiving people even today. He hasn't changed his tactics because they have been proven true and they work very effectively. So let me give you a few things on what the devil desires. Can I say, first of all, the devil desires to intimidate you. The devil wants to make you feel small and needy. He is the bully of bullies. He wants to uh, uh, show up and snort and stomp and wants to make you feel so insignificant and so useless and so weak uh, and so invaluable that you will cower down and listen to what he has to say. Why do you think the Lord penned it down in Romans 8, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world? Why do you think, it, that's not Romans 8, but why do you think he penned that down? Why do you think that he penned down that we're more than conquerors in Christ? Because the Lord knew our frames, he knew our mindset, and he knew how uh, uh, the devil works, and the devil wants to intimidate you, so the devil will absolutely make you feel like you are no match for him. In your flesh you're not. But through Christ we can do all things. Hmm? But the devil wants to intimidate you. He wants to make you feel so insignificant. He wants to make you feel like you don't have as much talent as somebody, or you're not as good a Christian as somebody, or you can't pray like somebody, or you can't witness like somebody, or you can't uh, uh, be effective on the job like somebody else. And, and uh, he'll do that, and he'll work on you, and work on your psyche, and work on everything about you to intimidate you. He does it from uh, the pulpit to the back pew. He wants to intimidate you. He'll intimidate preachers. He'll say, oh, so-and-so preaches and folks get saved. You preach and folks don't get saved. You must not be much of a preacher. He'll tell some singers, whoa, so-and-so gets up to sing and they shout the house down. You get up to sing and there's not, a, there's not even a holy grunt. You must not be much of a singer. He'll tell Sunday school teachers, well, people don't want to sit in your class, but they want to sit in other people's class. You must not be much of a Sunday school teacher. And he'll intimidate people, he'll intimidate Christians. Uh, oh, so-and-so talked about witnessing on their job, and you never witness on your job. You must be a lousy Christian. He is trying to intimidate you to making you feel small and weak and insignificant. He'll, he'll try and tell you, oh, people don't take you serious. He just wants to intimidate you. Everywhere you go, he's in the shadows trying to make you feel small, weak, and needy. You ever feel that way? I mean, we're here. We might as well be honest. Who do you think makes you feel that way? The Lord? No. The Lord says, I've loved thee with an everlasting love. Huh? Why would the Lord intimidate you? The Lord wants to edify you. He wants to build you up. He wants to encourage you. The Lord wants you to realize if you lean on Him, uh, uh, you can accomplish anything in your life. Uh, who intimidates you then? Mm, sorry, no good devil. It's one of His desires to intimidate you. Hmm? He just wants to pick on you. And he may leave you alone for a little while, but then he'll come back with reinforcements and he'll hit you again and again and again and again. He knows you may not succumb to it today, but there's always tomorrow. And he seeks to intimidate you. Can I say the devil not only wants to intimidate you, he wants to isolate you. You've heard me say that in years gone by. One of the greatest tools of the devil is to isolate you. Because when he gets you alone, you'll listen to what he has to say. 
when you're in this setting and you're around God's people and you're around preaching and you're around singing and you're around good fellowship, uh, uh, you, you're, you feel you're full of faith and you think, wow, uh, what a blessing. Uh, and as long as you're in the sheepfold, uh, the devil knows that his odds of intimidating you and getting you to where he wants you uh, will not happen. Uh, but if he can get you away from the sheep, if he can get you out by yourself, uh, if he can get you to just give him a little bit of time and start listening to him, He'll get you, just like he did Eve. He didn't get Eve when she was with Adam. He got her when she's alone. He always seeks to isolate you. When did Elijah pout under the juniper tree when he was alone? Hmm? Say what happened? See, when he was under by the brook Cherith, he's drinking by the brook, and the ravens was bringing him food. He's out there fl uh, flourishing with the Lord. The devil couldn't touch him there. But whoa, after he come down off the mountain and see the people had went back into the doldrum of uh, not knowing who God was uh, after the great victory and the fire fell, uh, uh, then you find him underneath the juniper tree alone saying, God, kill me. Well, where did he get that thought? Can I help you with something? The Lord never, ever puts it in your mind for you to take your own life. Hmm? The Lord puts it in your mind to be ready. He's a coming. But He never gives you the idea, you, you know, life's not worth living. Just end it. So who gives you that thought? And why was Elijah telling the Lord, just kill me? I'm not better than my father's. Hmm? Because when he isolates you, he will intimidate you to the point you'll listen and it starts making sense. Did not he tell Eve that the Lord didn't want you to eat of the tree of knowledge because you'll become as gods, knowing good and evil? Hmm. Does he not tell us what he wants us to hear? He never tells us the whole picture. But he does that when he isolates us. When he gets you alone, he'll put thoughts in your head, and he'll start talking to you in the dangerous things when you start listening to him. See, when you have others in your life, you don't hear him. But when he gets you off alone, in the still of the night, and fear grips your soul, he'll start speaking, and oh, it makes perfect sense. And see, he desires and wants to intimidate you. He wants to isolate you, but then can I say this? Then he wants to indoctrinate you. Once he gets your ear, he's going to teach you what he wants you to know. And he indoctrinates in so many different ways. He indoctr indoctrinates through deception. The devil will never tell you the truth. At best, he'll tell you partial truths. Look at what he said to Eve. He just twisted the word of God a little bit, but just enough to cause doubt. He wants to deceive you. He's a deceiver. He's very subtle. Hmm? He's never in a hurry. He's very patient. He's subtle. He just waits and waits, kind of like a spider makes the spider web. He just waits for his prey to fall into it. He's very subtle, very crafty, and he knows how to craft that web for you to fall into it. He wants to deceive you. He wants you to think it's okay. He wants you to think that there's no problem. Just twist it a little bit, just enough for it to make sense. And your natural man thinks, yeah, I could do that. That'd be all right. Hmm? He indoctrinates you through deception. Hmm? He did not, he indoctrinates you through delights. The Bible says there are pleasures in sin for a season. Amen. And the great rule of the devil is if it feels good, do it. And so if he can get you deceived enough to where you get to look around saying, well, there's no, nothing wrong in it. It'll be okay. I can uh, 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 still have this and be a Christian too. And all of a sudden, those delights take hold on you, and they're not so easy to get away from. Hmm? Did he not tell Eve, this day you'll not die? You'll become like gods, knowing good and evil. But she did die spiritually that day. And can I say, he wants to give you delights and pleasures. It's amazing how many things he has out there that will entertain or draw your attention away from God. Hmm? He indoctrinates you. 
If it feels good, do it. Yes, sir. Who cares what anybody else thinks? The very essence of sin is my right to my claim to myself. Well, I'm not hurting anybody else. Hogwash. No man lives unto himself. No man dies unto himself. Somebody is always getting hurt. Amen. Hmm? But he indoctrinates you through deception and through delights. And then through drive. Uh, can I say, the devil always preys on the weak. Oh, he attacks everybody, make no mistake. But he preys on the weak. Those that are weak uh, long to be what they're not. So he will indoctrinate them and he will give them drive. He will empower them or give them something to live for. Something they've never had. And that's what they long for. Can I say everybody wants to be loved. Everyone, everyone wants to be accepted. That's why a lot of people get really caught up in all of these lifestyle sins. It's not because that's what they ever intended but it, it causes them to be accepted. It causes them to feel loved. It causes them to have something they've never had before. If you ever look at the ones that really get in trouble and are overcome with a lot of wickedness, they're usually folks who are withdrawn from society. They're folks with very low self-esteems. They're folks who, who generally have been picked on and bullied and told that we're, they were useless from everybody, from family members to classmates. And the devil come on the scene and start putting things in them to tell them, hey, you are somebody special. You can be cared for. And all of a sudden they start dyeing their hair. They start looking a different way. They start acting a different way. What empowered them to do that? What empowered them to get involved in what they're involved in? The devil. Hmm? Shame on the church for us not telling people Jesus loves them. And they are accepted in the beloved. And there is a place where they can come and find true joy and love and happiness. Shame on us for not doing that amongst our own selves, let alone the world. Hmm? Amen. I've contended for years that if the church would have been what the church should have always been, we would not be in the shape we're in in America today. Hmm? Can I say, that sorry devil, he'll intimidate you. He'll isolate you. He wants to indoctrinate you. But never lose sight, his whole purpose is to incinerate you. Amen. He wants to absolutely overcome you and destroy you. The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. That is his whole mission. He wants to destroy you. If you're lost, he wants to destroy you in hell forevermore. If you're saved, he wants to destroy everything about you. He wants to destroy your testimony. He wants to destroy your touch of God. He wants to destroy your purpose in life. He wants to leave you bankrupt, useless, and on the side of the road where you have no voice for God ever again. He wants to incinerate you. Hmm? Can I say this? He'll discourage you. That's where it always starts. Nobody ever one day just says, oh, I just think I'll quit on God and get out of church. Folks get discouraged. Amen. How they get discouraged? Well, any number of ways. Somebody doesn't shake your hand. The devil uses that to discourage you. Uh, somebody get, stands up and testifies how the Lord really blessed them with a new job or blessed them with something and you're sitting there and the Lord didn't bless you and all of a sudden the devil uses that to discourage you. Hmm? Uh, the preacher goes out to dinner with somebody else but doesn't go out to dinner with you and all of a sudden the devil uses that to discourage you. I mean, there's any number of things. You, you, you know, name it. And the devil will use it to discourage people. Hmm? Why? Because the devil wants to incinerate you. He wants to destroy you. Yes, and he uses discouragement. There's all kinds of things that can discourage you. Shoot. Listen to weather. Discourage you. Hmm? After he discourages you, he wants to depress you. Depression is real. Depression will cause you not to think right. Cause you not to eat right. Cause you not to sleep right. Cause you not to live right. 
cause you not to enjoy anything, you're depressed. It will drag you down to places you never thought were possible. Depression is a great tactic of the devil. The Lord came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. The Lord gave us joy, and joy is our strength. The joy of the Lord's our strength. So what is depression? It's the opposite of both of that. It's not an abundant life, and it's not joyful. Can I say, the devil wants to depress you. He wants you to feel so insignificant about yourself. He wants to absolutely make you feel like you are worthless. Hmm? Can I say there are some forms of depression you don't even know what you're going through. You don't even know how to cry out for help because you yourself don't know how low you really are. Hmm? Depression is a tremendous, tremendous disease that is affecting homes all across our communities and our country. It's even affecting our churches. Hmm? If you haven't heard that message I've got on uh, ravening wolves and, uh, and, and uh, e uh, ravening wolves and lions, something about ravening wolves and devouring lions. Get that message from Brother Randy. It's all about depression, those inner turmoils that people face. Uh, my dear friends, the devil's slick. He'll discourage you, then he'll depress you for the sole purpose of defiling you. He wants you to blow your testimony and let sin take its hold on your life. Now, we don't think in terms like this. But something that starts out very little, very insignificant, can end up defiling you. Whatever fruit it was in the garden wasn't any different than any other fruit hanging off any other tree in the garden. But the only difference was God said, don't eat of that one. Yep. It was insignificant, didn't look like much, but it brought sin to the world. It's amazing how just a little time on a computer or a little time in front of a television, a little time on a video game, a little time reading something that isn't from the Lord, a little time conversing with somebody, a little time uh, 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 spending, caught up watching something that you shouldn't watch. It's amazing how that little insignificant thing can destroy you. Amen. See, deep down inside, we think we can handle it because the devil tells us we can. But you can't handle it, friend. It's more powerful than any of us. That's why we ought to run from it. That's why God said, resist the devil, he'll flee from you. Draw nigh to God, and God will draw nigh to you. But too many times we don't draw nigh to God until it's too late, and then we're too embarrassed. He wants to defile you. Hmm? I don't know. What really started all this thinking came from this. This little sheet of paper. When I was down in South Carolina, I took my box... And I just was going through my box, and I came across this letter. I forgot about this letter. This letter was dated June tenth, two 2002. So I've had it a while. Hmm? Many of you weren't even in the church back then. It says this, Sir, I deeply resent having to dispose of the enclosed material. It was never requested. This letter was mailed here to the church with the preaching tape and the material that we'd left on somebody's door. Okay? I'm amazed at the lack of concern for the environment. The earth really is the Lord's and all that is therein. I'm sending it back to you in hopes that you and your committees will rethink such mass distribution. How many trees and how much room in landfills? What they were saying is our materials was destroying the earth. Hmm. He goes on to say this, I am not a Baptist. I have no desire to be a Baptist. If I had your careless attitude toward this planet would convince me otherwise. As it is in heaven, so let it be here. Let people realize the importance of everything. 
I have worked for years to end receipt of junk mail. I have been involved in recycling efforts for over 30 years. Now to find a so-called Christian church doing this. I do not even dare give my name and address for fear I will simply be put on yet another list. Even your prayer list would scare me. Now I bring that up to point out that this person was so deceived into thinking we can save this earth. He even tried to refer to the Bible a couple times. If he'd really referred to what Peter wrote, he realized this earth's going to burn up someday. You can't save it. It is more than a landfill problem. It's a cesspool problem of sin. Hmm? But this person was so deceived that the very thing that would bring them eternal life, joy, and happiness was in that preaching tape and in those materials, uh, and yet he mailed it back to us 17 years ago. Under his own admission, he'd been trying to save the planet for 30 years. This person might already be dead. And if so, he mailed back the very thing that could have caused him not to die and go to hell. Amen. But by putting postage and mailing it back, he actually paid to go to hell. Do hmm. you think the devil's crafty? He's crafty. He seeks to defile and to deceive. Now listen. If you're saved, the devil cannot have you. You've already been bought and paid for. But that does not exempt you from him desiring to have you, just like he did Peter. Now, even though he cannot have you, he seeks to make you ineffective. We preached this morning on being a blessing. You know what the last thing he wants you to do is be a blessing. He wants you to be a burden. Mm -hmm. So how does he make us ineffective? First of all, he makes us ineffective with our attitudes. You could have a poor attitude and it ruins everybody around you. Hmm? There's a song in my youth, my childhood, says one bad apple don't have to spoil the whole batch of girls. Osmond Brothers. Andy Williams had them. Famous. Anybody ever hear them? Me and Miss Billy the only ones that admit we know the Osmond Brothers. <laughs> Can I be real honest right before God and for y'all? On uh, Labor Day weekend, Miss Annette got culturized. She'd never been to Rabbit Hash. Never had been there. And so uh, uh, Christian Tay and I took Miss Annette to Rabbit Hash. Just so happened that a lot of people that Brother Brian used to run with happened to be there that day. There was nothing but Harleys everywhere, huh? Some beautiful bikes and then some scary bikes, okay? So we saw the old general store at Rabbit Hash. What a real blessing. Of course, it's not the old one. The old one burnt down, but it's been remade to look like the old one. And so we're there checking out everything. Went into the back room and they had albums. Anybody remember what albums are? Do you know this year is the first year since CDs come out that albums, vinyl albums, have outsold CDs? Because everybody's going back to the old scratchy sound that we grew up with, huh? So we're looking through there because, you know, the kids are, you know, Sydney discovered albums. She, was, she thought that was the greatest thing in the world. We was a cracker brush. She said, look, they have an album. Said, Mom says, uh, hey, Sydney, we've got a whole basement full of them, you know? Yeah. So anyway, we bought her a record player, and she buys albums. So we were looking through albums, and then, and I found the Osmond Brothers Live. <laughs> I saw them in 1972 at the Cincinnati Gardens. This album was done in 73. What a blessing. Took me back. Ray, you had hair. What a blessing. Good year. It was a good year. So the Osmond Brothers says, one bad apple, don't you? But can I help you with something? It does. And your bad attitude can destroy people all around you. Do you ever just have a bad attitude and not know why you was in a bad spirit and had a bad attitude? Yep. You was being nasty and you didn't even know why you was being nasty. You didn't want to be nasty. You was just being nasty. Because the devil desires to have you. That he may sift you as wheat. Huh? 
When you have a bad attitude, you cannot point people to Jesus. Amen. Hmm? The contrary. The devil will point out you've got a bad attitude and tell everybody you supposedly belong to Jesus. Makes you ineffective. Yep. Can I say this? He uses apathy in your life. Amen. Where you just sit down on God. Yeah. Just go with flow. You're on the float of life. Whatever comes, goes. You don't do anything for Jesus. I'd hate to think about all that Jesus has done for me and then me have no desire to do anything for him. Amen. Hmm? Has he not been good to you? Sure. He sure has, and he's been good to me. So why would I not want to tell others about him and let others experience his goodness? Amen. But yet when we get apathetic, that's exactly what happens. We don't really care about anything. We just get numb. It's where the devil wants, to, wants you to be. Can I say this? He wants you to become ineffective through addiction. Now, I know there's a lot of talk in the news about addiction and opioids, and they're very dangerous, and they are greatly affecting our society. And it absolutely irks me to no end that all the Congress can talk about are false charges against the president, and there are real problems facing the American people that are never being addressed. That irks me. Hmm? I think they ought to take them all out and throw them out. Hmm? Why don't we do something for the American people? Uh, we are wasting billions of dollars on sorry, no good investigations, and there are people hurting in our streets and in our societies. Uh, the bridge going into Ohio on 75 is going to fall in the river. Every president in my lifetime has said that bridge needs to be fixed. Hmm? Trump said it's the number one most needed infrastructure to be replaced in the country. And there it sits. Hmm? But yet we can have investigation after investigation after investigation. Hmm? It only took seven months to build the Hoover Dam. It's taken... 46 years of my life for them recognizing that there's a problem down there on I and they still haven't touched one bolt in it. Yeah. Hmm. What can I say? We have addictions that the devil uses to destroy people. Now I'm talking about Christian people. As we sit here tonight, do not bury your head in the sand like an ostrich like I mentioned this morning. There are people that attend churches that are addicted to hard drugs, yep. yeah. prescription drugs. Yep. Yeah. There are people who are addicted to pornography. Yeah. There are people who are addicted to TV. Mm -hmm. There are people who are addicted to Facebook. Yeah. You don't believe that? Every time I say it, people cringe. You know why? Because they can't give it up. Yeah. That? They can't do it. Hmm? If you can't lay it down and walk away from it because uh, you want to spend more time with Jesus, you've got a problem. It's called addiction. I don't care what it is. There are people that are addicted to nicotine. There are people who are addicted to chocolate. I mean, where do you want to draw the line? Addiction is causing people to lose their testimony and lose their desire to be used of God. He don't care what he gets you addicted to. He just wants to draw you away from God and make you ineffective. Yep. Hmm? There are people addicted to everything. Watch TV. There's people addicted to plastic surgery. Why? Huh? People are addicted to things. Now don't go out of here and throw your medicine down, down and flush it down the toilet. I mean, go talk to your doctor. If you don't need it, you don't need it. But if you need it, you need it, okay? Don't go out of here and throw your blood pressure pills away and have a stroke and blame me for it, all right? You'll be ineffective there too, huh? But you know what I'm saying. There are some people that don't need things. Why do you think the opioid crisis is as bad as it is? As it is? For years, doctors prescribed pain medicine and never got people off of it. Now they can only prescribe so many pills. Hmm? Let you in on a little secret. That's why Brother Doug never ever took any. Not because I think I'm bigger than that. Not because I don't have pain. I just didn't want to be tempted to always want it. Hmm? Because I'm going to tell you, pain's pain. It don't matter what measure you want to, it hurts. And if you can pop something and the pain goes away, all of a sudden your body will start liking that. Hmm? 
And if you're not careful, you get addicted to things. It's happening all across the country. I'm telling you, crafty, he's a slick devil. He wants to make you ineffective. Hmm? Makes people ineffective through being, uh, through acrimony, being re resentful. There are people come to church and they resent things. People come to church and they're bitter. I want to tell you something. You cannot, you cannot, you cannot be effective for Jesus with a bitter spirit. You can't be a blesser in and be bitter. Can't do it. Hmm? I've had people come in and get mad at me over flowers around the church. What happened to a flower? I don't know. Sit there bitter because the flower's gone. I don't know. I'll buy you a flower. Who cares? It's a flower. Got news for you. Wintertime's going to die anyway. Who cares? It's amazing what people will get bitter over. I want to help you something. They just didn't wake up bitter. They've been far too long being dealt with by the devil and they allow that root of bitterness to keep getting greater and greater and greater in their life till they act on it. There are folks sit around the church, church houses across this country just bitter. Sister. I've heard them tell preachers, you're not going to move me. I think the Holy Ghost couldn't move them, huh? Dynamite couldn't move them. Need Brother Bobby 66 sticks to move them. Are you listening? Let me say you see how the devil makes you ineffective. The devil makes some ineffective by being attention seekers. There's some people always seeking for attention. Can I help you with something? The Lord never will share his glory with anybody. Either the attention's on the Lord or it's on you. And the devil wants you to put the attention on you. Yep. Hmm? It's never about us. It's always about the Lord. Amen. And there's some people that can come into a service and never say a word, but the attention will be on them. Did you ever notice that? Why is that? Because the devil's got them right where he wants them. And many times they don't even know it. The devil desires to have you tonight. We're not ignorant of his devices, but he desires to have you. Next time you feel pulled to just get away from the sheepfold, you better run to the sheepfold because he wants to isolate you. Next time you start feeling like something is telling you you're a second-class Christian, you need to run to the house of God. You're not a second-class Christian. You need to run to the lap of Jesus. You're not a second-class Christian. The devil's trying to intimidate you. And next time you feel like just listening to the devil, you better run back to your Bible. Because the devil will lie to you. He wants to indoctrinate you. He wants to tell you how wonderful you are and how great you could be doing this and doing that. Hmm? I wonder how many people have missed the blessings of God because the devil told them, rather than put your tithe in the plate, once you use it for this, you can make up your tithe next week. Hmm? He'll lie to you. Hmm? Yeah, then you'll spend that whole week with your tithe money and the curse of God on you. Yeah. Hmm? Uh, he'll lie to you. He'll indoctrinate you. Don't listen to the devil. Hmm? Never lose sight. He wants to incinerate you. He wants to destroy you. He wants to destroy your family, your home, everything about you. He wants to destroy you. Again, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Draw nigh to God. God will draw nigh to you. To see and you resist the devil, he'll flee from you. You can overcome that sorry no good booger through the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. Just keep your eyes on Jesus. Because if you don't, the devil will have you in his clutches before you even know it. The devil desired Peter and he desires you. Fortunately, the Lord's praying for us. You trust the Lord. You listen to the Lord. And you'll overcome the devil. Just like the Lord did. Let's all stand. Maybe you need to come and ask the Lord for some help tonight. Maybe the Lord's burdened you with somebody you need to pray for. You need to come pray for them. Maybe tonight, the Lord spoke to you about something totally different. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved and you want to get saved. This would be a good night to get saved. Brother Ray, come get a song of invitation while they're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. 
Lord, I don't know why this message for tonight, other than the fact of what I stated, somebody needed it. So, Father, I pray you'd help us all to realize the devil, he's, he's a deceiver. He's real. He has power. He doesn't have all power, but he has power. And, Lord, he, he strives to destroy our lives and make us ineffective for your cause. So, Father, help us tonight. Help us to lean unto thine understanding. Help us to uh, sow in righteousness. Help us, Lord, to long for your presence in our lives. Bless these thy people. Meet every need of your heart. And Lord, now this invitation's yours. Maybe somebody just feels led to be a blessing in this service tonight. Go tell somebody they love them. I don't know. But Lord, just help folks to mind the Lord and certainly help those in the altar. And we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.